Somebody asked about ground clearance on these two bikes, so I figured I'd make a video. Um, here's the Can-Am. It's got the two inch lift. It's got a half inch spring spacer. Actually, no, it's a three quarter inch spring spacer and the preload maxed out. In the front, just a little shy of 14 inches. Let's give it 13 and seven eighths. Both the bikes are just, you know, rolled up and parked and I hopped off of them. So with the rider, you expect a little bit of sag. Team at the very bottom of the frame. Let's give it 16 even. Okay. So 16 even. That doesn't look too bad for the Can-Am, right? Now the back's where the real problem is. Background clearance. 13 and 5 eighths. All right. Okay. So I said 18 earlier. It's really at the very bottom of the frame. 17 and 7 eighths. Okay, and this is with... Um, both bikes lifted the max amount you can lift it on stock axles. It's about to the top, just about 30. And the 29.5, across it, just about 28. So, uh, too much difference in tire height. Divide that by two because ground clearance for the radius. So, we'll add an inch ground clearance to the Can Am. I compiled the numbers and popped them to Excel real quick. So for the Can-Am, the average ground clearance on the front uh, front to rear average is 13.85. The Rubicon's average ground clearance front and rear is 16.875, 14 inches and 17 inches average. Um, we'll give the Can-Am a one inch penalty. So we'll subtract one from the Rubicon because its tires are essentially two inches taller. And that gives the Can um, the Rubia corrected average ground clearance of 15.875 and the Can-Am's average ground clearance 13.85. So even with accounting for the tires, the Rubicon still has two inches more ground clearance. They both have about the same amount of lift. The axles are maxed out um, to where they're lifted as high as you can reliably lift these bikes. I'm going to do a temperature comparison. I'm going to start up both bikes and let them idle for five minutes and take all the temperatures that might, you know, be relevant to the ride. Look at temperature. These are all the relevant temperatures after idling for five minutes. Um, you can see all of them. The Can-Am has an average temperature of all the surfaces um, that affect the rider of 120 degrees roughly, and the Honda has an average temperature of 101 degrees roughly. This is after idling for five minutes. It's approximately 92 degrees outside. Uh, the Can-Am is really hot, and that's just sitting there idling. It does idle a little higher than the Honda, but I really don't understand how it's generating that much heat at idle. And once you actually look at these numbers, how much they differ, especially when you look at the specs on the Can-Am, and the Can-Am tells you that from the factory, um, the Can-Am has more ground clearance than the Rubicon. I measured them both stock and I found that to be a lie. And even lifted, it is uh, still a blatant lie. And these numbers are not like scientific data or anything like that for the heat. I'm just trying to find a way to somewhat represent how uncomfortable the Can-Am is to feel in numbers uh, because it's hard to explain how hot it feels. It does a pretty good job. It's almost impossible to get a really good um, measurement of how much heat is flowing over the rider in different situations. but you can just see sitting there at idle, the Can-Am is that much hotter, and all that heat on those surfaces is gonna leave the bike by passing by the rider. Um, you're going forward, and then when the fan kicks on, it's just, it's cooking you. So, of all the problems I have with the Can-Am, the main reason I'm getting rid of it is because it's too hot to ride in the south. It might be fine up in Canada, where it's freezing half the time, and you want a bike to essentially turn half of its fuel into heat for you, but um, down here in the civilized world, where it's nice and warm, the Can-Am is ridiculously hot. Simulates the ambient air that you're blowing across the rider. 93 degrees. Pretty hot, but it's a hot day. 110 balls. 120, how about 120 degrees, depending on where. 96, 96, 96 degrees, 97 degrees. 115 degrees. Much cooler, there's no exhaust on this side, 98 degrees. 140 degrees. That's pretty hot. Yeah, 140 degrees. And 12, that's not too bad, but God forbid your foot touches that. 140, 150 degrees. Lovely, can't have lovely. So I'm not the only one having these heat issues. There are dozens of pictures on Google. Um, just do a quick search of people's air boxes melting, and we have a hole in your air box after your air filter. All kinds of dirt goes in there, and water destroys your motor. Um, these bikes get so hot they're melting their own air boxes. On a ride a few weeks ago, my buddy's family's bike, um, the seat actually caught on fire on a Gen 1 Can-Am. They just give off way too much heat. I don't understand how the company is not addressing this as a major concern.